Conversation with a Geographer. I'm Mike DeVivo, Professor of Geography at Grand Rapids Community College. And today, we are very fortunate to have Ben Gerloffs, Assistant Professor of Geography at the University of Hong Kong. Ben, thank you so much for joining us today. No, thanks so much for having me. It's great to you be know, here. You know, it's great. It's not often we can have one of our distinguished alumni present here. And I, I'm, I'm really happy you were able to make it. As I uh, talk with others in this series, I ask about what got you interested in pursuing geography. And so I'll ask you to think about your uh, childhood, your, your, your early studies in college, the graduate school and things like that. So, so why don't you talk to us about it? Yeah, sure, of course, happy to. Um, thinking about childhood stuff and interest there in geography, I remember I had a grandfather who was in the war uh, in, the, in the Pacific loved maps, loved traveling mm -hmm. around the country with just a compass on the on the dash of his big van, his big conversion van. He had a strong influence on me as a kid and gave me atlases and things and globes to look at. And so I was always really interested in maps and globes. I remember being fascinated by the, I'm going to say it's the goods home alone scene, the, the mm -hmm. projection as a kid thinking, how can that be how the world looks? And it just, it's kind just, of disjointed. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and covering a big a couple of Atlas pages. I remember laying on the, on the living room floor and just looking at that projection and, and wondering about the world. That interest, uh, I would say didn't really develop until much later. So I had this kind of passing interest in maps and globes and things, but um, wasn't a very good student in school. So ended up, I'm from a working class background. Uh, I was sort of encouraged to pursue college, but not pressured really. Wasn't sure what I was going to do. Didn't go to school right away after high school. Didn't have a lot of college options. Didn't really pursue or develop those. Kind of just bounced around uh, living in a couple different states, snowboarding and working manual labor jobs and doing other dumb stuff. Uh, that was very fun at the time, but I, I looked around when I was about 20 and realized that all my friends were halfway through their university studies and were going to be pursuing careers pretty soon. And I wasn't on that path. And so I thought, man, I should, I should do something different. So I moved back into my parents' house mm -hmm. when I was 20 and enrolled at GRCC. I was thrilled that GRCC would have me because I had this very poor academic background. Mm -hmm. And GRCC was a lifeline. Uh, I... I don't know exactly how it works now, but at the time you could take a bunch of different classes, put them together into a package that would be transfer transferable to a four-year sure. institution. And the range of classes you could take was enormous within that. And so I took yoga and poetry. I took a class on immigration where I met you and mm -hmm. the wonderful Mike Light also. And that is where my interest in geography was really kind of reignited and, and became a, a full-on thing for me. Um, I talked to you a lot. I was super lucky to have your mentorship. Uh, the next semester after that immigration class, I enrolled in Intro to Physical Geography, mm -hmm. and that lit my interest up like crazy. Uh, and that stuff continues, although I've, I've become specialized in human geography. Mm -hmm. That early interest in physical geography is still there. I think my favorite thing to see mapped still is the modified Kepin Geiger. It's <laughs> my favorite maps. Love. Well, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I, I still do some kind of human environment interaction mm -hmm. work, uh, but primarily I'm an urban geographer now. Um, anyway, so that's that's kind of where my interest became more fully developed. I started thinking about the different subfields of geography, uh, took a lot of classes with you, transferred to Aquinas College. I had thought about going to a number of places mm -hmm. um, after GRCC, and I still think about that decision once in a while. There, there were options that would have been more research intensive universities that had more resources for, for doing research, uh, bigger laboratories, a greater diversity of faculty and these kinds of things. I would have gained different technical skills and stuff perhaps. Um, but what I really wanted and what I really got at Aquinas was training in qualitative methods. Absolutely. Um, and more especially in geographical writing, right? That was really Well, important. and, and, and the, the, the faculty at Aquinas, um, deserve a lot of credit for preparing students for graduate school. Yeah. They really do. Yeah, yeah, I think they're quite good at that and mm -hmm. I benefited from that immensely. So while I was there, I worked with Rich McCluskey a lot, mm -hmm. um, kind of as my primary advisor. He introduced all kinds of cool economic geography and other sort of subfields to me. We did an independent study reading Don Mitchell's first book, The Lie mm -hmm. of the Land, about yes. uh, migrant labor in California. Right. And that was a whole new genre of geographical study for me, cultural landscapes and historical geography, which I knew a little bit about, but was really learning through that book. And I decided I wanted to go to grad school. So I, I wrote to Don Mitchell and, and 
said basically, I don't know what this is, but whatever it is, I want to do it. Uh, <laughs> he was kind enough to accept me at Syracuse. So I went and did a master's there. I studied um, kind of a cultural landscape study of a part of greater Chicago called mm-hmm. Oak Brook. Um, became enamored with urban geography. So in my master's is where I really became an urban geographer and started getting more invested uh, in those kinds of literatures, um, things like gentrification, uh, like urban form and urban processes that uh, kind of spill out from from central cities over time, uh, but also things like urban planning and how the law impacts how places are made and remade. Uh, I wanted to stay at Syracuse and do my PhD because I loved working with Don and there were so many other great faculty members there that I really learned a ton from. Uh, I was really stretched and challenged as a student and, and as a young scholar. But it was not a great place for my partner at the time. And so we cast about for other options. We ended up in New York uh, because I could go to Rutgers, which I thought was a very good place for me to do a PhD. And my partner could be in Brooklyn. And so Mm -hmm. we went there. Uh, I thought I would do a kind of scaled up study of what I'd done for my master's, uh, kind of extending those same questions about edge cities and urban planning and its impact on on the nature of place to the Chicago metro region. Mm -hmm. Uh, when I got to Rutgers, fairly quickly, I decided that wasn't the study I really wanted to do uh, for my PhD. It was something I didn't want to invest like a handful more years in. I wanted to do something else. And so I talked to my first advisor, Bob Lake. Um, I later, within about a year of that, took on a co-advisor, Asher Gertner, who arrived there from a stint at the LSE at the same time as I did. Mm-hmm. And that structure worked really well for me. Um, Bob, who was nearing the end of his career, and, and Asher, who was very early in his career, Um, Both are brilliant, but they gave me like quite different kinds of advice. Oftentimes it really worked out well. But I told both of them that I was interested in doing something else. Like I I had pitched this project to you and this is how I got in, but I'm kind of interested in moving on. And they were both super supportive. I had done a lot of reading on this uh, concept of the right to the city and this political Mm -hmm. project and program of the right to the city. And one of the movements that really had grabbed my attention was happening in Mexico City. Absolutely. And, so I and said, it was at that time that Mexico City was no longer, or it was in, it was in transition, right? It was in transition uh, geopolitically. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, it was, so when I went, um, the constitutional reform, I think is what you were mm-hmm. talking about, that the basically created a 32nd federative entity, more or less a state within the Mexican Union uh, for Mexico City. That constitutional reform came in 2016. Um, I started thinking about doing this project in about 2012, 2012, 2013. So when I first started going, this was in the works, but not in a way that would have been on my radar. Um, I I learned about that much later, um, closer to when it actually happened. But I was interested in this movement. I thought they seemed to be doing really cool stuff. They had promoted this charter, uh, a charter of rights, essentially, that the mayor had signed and a lot of deputies had signed in 2010. It seemed like a really And the mayor was... At that time, let's see, that mayor was Ebrard, Marcelo Ebrard. Okay. Uh, And uh, so I was interested in what they were doing. I thought it was the closest uh, to like the really cool version of that theory that I'd read about. I thought they were doing like a really big tent kind of movement. Everybody was sort of invited. There were environmental questions and gender questions and violence and political economy in all sorts of ways. And, And all that was coming together in this movement. I thought that was fascinating. Really wanted to go do a kind of ethnography of this movement. And my advisors, didn't ask me questions like, Ben, do you know anything about Mexico or Mexico City? Do you speak Spanish? Do you have any context there? These questions were not asked. <laughs> they were just really encouraging. They said, why don't you try and get some funding to go down and do immersion courses, build a network for the first couple of years? It, it reminds me kind of like what, uh, if I recall, Marvin Mikesell commenting on how Sauer advised him about where he was going to do his doctoral dissertation, mm. field work. He said, you know, it's like in North Africa, I think. It's a good area. <laughs> it's a good region. So there you go. Fair enough. <laughs> so uh, I, this is what I did. I, I got some funding to go down and do immersion courses for a couple of summers and start building a network. I, people were really generous with this like bumbling graduate student who barely spoke any Spanish mm-hmm. at all for the first couple trips. Um, opened a lot of doors. I, I made connections with the university, the big university there, UNAM, and also with um, Habitat International Coalition, Latin America, HEEC, as they say. Mm-hmm. Um, really great folks. So devel- developed this project, devised this study I was going to go and do with this movement. When I finally arrived there in the fall of 2015 to do the project, 
as happens to so many graduate students, it wasn't quite what I thought. Right? Things needed to pivot. Um, my project needed to change. It became much more historical. Uh, the dissertation itself became kind of a bifurcated thing where there's a big chunk of historical geography trying to figure out like how the city that I was learning about in in the, the world of today, the contemporary city, um, had its roots in these massive transformations in the 20th century in particular. Uh, then the second sort of half of the dissertation is, is sort of case studies of particular moments um, that were happening then, right, right in 2015, 2016, including this constitutional reform that dramatically changed the political landscape there and was the result of decades of organizing and politics and everything else. So that uh, was a really fun project to work on. I really enjoyed it. Uh, after that, let's see, I had a visiting teaching gig at Dartmouth for a year, which was really fantastic. I was mentored by some really great folks there, uh, including Mona Domash and Frank McGilligan and, and Chris Nen and, and many others. Um, that's a program that I think they now have a doctoral program, but at the time they, they didn't have any graduate programs in geography. Um, the specifics of that doctoral program we, we can check on later. I think that it might be joint with some other things. Mm -hmm. But I do think that I think they do have in-house PhD students now. Hmm. But at the time they did not. Uh, and so the, the faculty there really spent a lot of time and, and effort mentoring uh, early career folks. So postdocs and people who came like myself as a visiting assistant professor. Um, they, you know, hosted uh, practice job talks for us and we're on the job market and, and just did a lot of really fantastic mentoring. Um, so that was a really great year after that. You know, I think, I think Caroline Faria, who had a visiting appointment there several years ago before she went to Florida and then later to Texas, she commented on how appreciative she was of the mentoring she got at Dartmouth. Yeah, I feel the same way. I yeah. felt very cared for. Uh, challenged also it wasn't uh it wasn't just you're great your stuff is great it was that plus you need to fix this part right this this part's probably not going to work for that audience or did you ever think about this this way have you read this person's work just really really invested in early career folks can i ask you how did how did you feel having you know tread the path that 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 you pursued having gone from not doing well in college or initially, and then finally being in Dartmouth of all places, you know, did you think you never would have gotten there, you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was, uh, I've, I've had a professional career of incredible privilege and I, I felt that kind of every step of the way. Uh, Dartmouth was a something of a shock. I mean, the, the immensity of, of talent and resources at a place like that uh, not that Rutgers didn't have that or Syracuse didn't have that. These are all fantastic institutions. But to have world-famous folks coming through, you know, on a daily sometimes, but often weekly basis, like world thought leaders coming through to give a talk that you can just rock up to, is incredible. It's an incredible experience, uh, quite it's, aside from the people in your own it department. Certainly, it certainly generates uh, many advantages for students in those environments, you know. For, for them to be able to come in contact with leaders in whatever fields they might be in, mm -hmm. you know, regularly. Yeah, and, and I say this to my students now um, at HKU, I, I work in Hong Kong now, uh, but I said it also when I was at Princeton and at Dartmouth and everywhere else I've been, like students, when I was a student, I didn't take full advantage oftentimes of, of these folks coming through. And that's that's true at, at any institution. Like GRCC has great speakers. Mm -hmm. uh, I went to a couple of those lectures when I was a student here. And I wish looking back that I had gone to way more. It's an it's an incredible privilege to be able to, to sit and listen to um, really fantastic, brilliant people discuss their work. It's, it's an enormous privilege. So that's what Dartmouth was like for me. I had a, a great time working with great students and great colleagues there. After a year, um, I went on to do a postdoc in Latin American studies at Princeton, mm -hmm. which again was a, a really challenging and wonderful experience. I uh, heard fantastic lectures. COVID arrived just at the tail end of my time there. And so my last, my last seminar went online about halfway through in, in March or so of 2020. Uh, while I was there, I was casting about for, for jobs, for permanent jobs. Um, I applied to some in Europe, a couple in Europe, a number in North America, and two in Asia. And the best offer I got, I thought, was at the University of Hong Kong. I really wanted to do comparative urban work. So mm -hmm. I'd spent years by then working in North America, in greater Chicago, greater Mexico City. 
And I've been doing a lot of reading around um, this kind of emergent set of practices of global comparative urbanism. Folks like um, Teresa Caldera and, and others that, that I was absolutely enamored with and, and still am. Uh, and I thought, oh, I need to I need to start doing some fieldwork in some other cities and developing relationships in those places and thinking about how these places inform each other, how urban processes in one part of the world inform how we think about uh, urban processes in another part of the world. And so was really excited to go to Asia. It was a difficult time to go to Hong Kong in the midst COVID of COVID was not friendly to it was, Asia. It was a mess. Mm -hmm. uh, my partner and I packed up all of our stuff. We got as far as Seoul the first time, and then we got turned around. Our, our paperwork wasn't quite correct for COVID, and so we got sent back to the States. It took another series of tests and weeks and whatever else. But we eventually arrived uh, before the semester started, and it's been a great experience there, too. Uh, my my interests haven't changed, but my geographical focus has, has broadened considerably. I'm doing fieldwork now in several places in Hong Kong, also have a project in Singapore, um, and also about to start some work in mainland China, uh, which will be really new and, and very exciting for me. So two, I have a project now that will be comparing a neighborhood in Hong Kong with, mm -hmm. with neighborhoods in um, Guangzhou and Shenzhen. So, and so this neighborhood comparison, what, what are some of the uh, variables you're looking at to compare? Sure. So that all of these projects that I've started in the last three years or so, they all work through this methodology that I call the aesthetic survey which is super rooted in cultural landscape study going all the way back to Sour. Mm -hmm. But it's kind of aimed at a problem of neighborhood transformation research, as, as I see it anyway. Um, there's a lot of talking past one another in that area. So gentrification or neighborhood change more generally. Uh, so many studies are based on, on a fairly tight methodology. They will use this particular measure to understand how a neighborhood is changing which is great and fine and super important. Um, I wanted to develop something that would be slightly more comprehensive or integrative. And so this aesthetic survey methodology has four parts. Uh, we do a land use survey, which is done in situ from what we can tell either talking to people or looking around. Um, we do a companion atlas of landscape photography. And those two components uh, are hopefully very soon going to be made publicly available for a lot of these projects. We're, we're hosting a, a website that we're currently building to make all that stuff publicly accessible. Uh, the third part is semi-structured interviews with folks from a variety of different backgrounds who have some relevance to this particular neighborhood that we're studying. Um, and then the fourth piece, oh, I've nearly forgotten it, uh, ethnographic observation, which takes the form of field notes, systematic field notes, um, linking back to how Sauer would have it, but also borrowing a lot from contemporary urban sure. anthropology. And, and You're else. exploring the cultural landscape, nevertheless. Exactly. And, and seeking to come up with answers to some probing interrogatives. I hope so. And the, the plan is that this aesthetic survey can be repeated, uh, perhaps every year or every couple of years for these neighborhoods. So the first one basically establishes a baseline. So when you, you do a survey of this neighborhood, we collect a ton of data but the objective here is to measure change, really, to understand change. And so when you, when you have one data set, you have essentially a snapshot of a neighborhood. It can tell you a lot about how the neighborhood has changed, especially the interviews. Uh, but what we really want is to have year on year a set of surveys so we can see over time, numerically, qualitatively, from a number of different angles, potentially, um, how a neighborhood is transforming and how those processes of transformation might be different one city to another, one moment in time to another, one neighborhood to another within the same city. Well, that seems like it would be very valuable for planning, provision of services, education, things of that nature. I hope so. That's the, that's the aim. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. that's great. So is, is that your principal focus in terms of research now? At the moment, yeah. Um, I, I'm wrapping up some stuff that was fieldwork that was conducted a few years ago in Mexico City. Um, I have, let's see, so the neighborhood-based research is three or so different different projects. Mm -hmm. uh, we're also, with a couple of collaborators, working on some kind of urban political ecology stuff in Hong Kong and possibly elsewhere in the fairly near future. Um, a project that looks at wet markets, consumption within wet markets, and the processes of negotiating value for commodities that are living beings which is a very different process, of course, than, than commodifying a, a non-living thing. So um, that's a super interesting literature, the literature on, on what's typically called lively commodities. But most of the work that's been done in that area, really fantastic, important work um, by folks like Rosemary Clare, Collard, and others, um, looks at either sort of companion animals or beasts of burden type animals, animals that do some kind of productive work or that live with you like your pet. 
um, which is again very very important, but hasn't that literature so far hasn't focused and has in, in fact like intentionally excluded dietary consumption of animals. Um, and so our work, we th we think uh, so far anyway, we've done interviews in 27 different wet markets in Hong Kong. We think that this shows that there's a a need to incorporate animals that are cultivated and, and traded for dietary consumption within this uh, conceptual umbrella of the lively commodity. I think there's there's enough similarity there to to make this this make sense. And also, we think there's a lot that this will add uh, to those that set of discussions around that that literature. That's fascinating. I, I, I mean, I, I find this all intriguing. And in Singapore, what are you doing there? That's a neighborhood-based program. Oh, that's that's also yeah. neighborhood-based. So we're comparing uh, one of the more, let's say, charismatic neighborhoods in Singapore and its process of transformation with one in Hong Kong. Uh, these are uh, Chengburu in Singapore mm -hmm. and Saingpun in Hong Kong. That's a big neighborhood. Yes. Big, those are really big neighborhoods. Yes. Yeah. And very, very different from one another. And mm -hmm. the process very, we've very, seen. Very different, yes. Wildly different, yeah. But both yeah. fascinating. So let's um, let's step back in time a bit, and I'm going to ask you to comment on um, on those that influenced you that were some of your peers in either um, graduate studies or undergraduate studies, or in uh, while 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 having a position as an academic in, at Dartmouth, Princeton, or even at HKU. Mm -hmm. Man. Uh, every step of the way, I've had fantastic peers, uh, folks who were really helpful in a variety of ways, and I've learned a lot in sort of different realms of mm -hmm. scholastic life uh, from these different folks. So when I was at GRCC and later at Aquinas, I was very lucky to have Katie Corson, who oh. of course know and mentored, mm -hmm. uh, as a as a fantastic peer, like really encouraging. We went through the process of a brilliant, program. yeah, absolutely and kind, yes, very very generous person. Yes, so we talked a lot about the experience of applying to grad school together and taking the GRE and these things mm -hmm. that you, you do as part of this process. Um, also talked about, well, many other things, but this was for me as a, as a person who uh, didn't expect to be in that position uh, a couple of years earlier, it was really, really helpful to have someone very, very smart and talented going through the same kind of process. Mm -hmm. um, so students who are applying to grad school now that, that work with me, um, I always advise them to try and find a, a friend who's also going through this process. So it's mm -hmm. super helpful to be able to trade information and stories and not necessarily always have to go to your sure, Certainly. And I ask this question because I think we far too often give short shrift to the influence of peers and colleagues. Yeah. You know? Yep. I think that's absolutely right. In graduate school, mm -hmm. uh, I arrived at Syracuse and was completely overwhelmed by the, the intellectual rigor of that department and that program. Super grateful for that experience, but I was kind of unprepared to like immediately design a project. And as a master's student, you don't have a lot of time, right? A two year master's, if you're gonna go and do field work and design a project, like that stuff happens pretty fast. And at Syracuse, at least at that time, the, the PhD students and the master's students were all kind of together. We all mm -hmm. took the same courses. And I was lucky to have a great cohort of I think seven other people, um, several of us became very close friends. Uh, but those folks uh, were super helpful thinking about Thor Ritz and, and Matul Barua and, and, and many others, um, Emily Kaufman, uh, in helping me to like, all right, all right, here's how you design a research project. Like, don't panic. All right, I know next week we have to share our research questions in this seminar. Like, don't panic that you're not sure what that's going to look like. <laughs> Here are some resources. Here's what I'm doing. Here are my, you know, the places I'm going to look for information. That was incredibly helpful. Um, also challenging. So, oh, you had you didn't read this yet? You should probably read that before you turn this part in or, or whatever. Um, that was, I, I learned as much from them as from, from my professors. Uh, and I had great professors there. So later in graduate school, it was, it was, Applying for funding together, we, you know, at, at Rutgers, um, a great group working with Asher Gertner. Uh, mm -hmm. We had a kind of lab group that we would meet on a semi-regular basis to trade stuff that we were writing, um, to swap grant applications. A lot of times we were applying for the same grants. And so uh, really nice to work with folks like Hudson McFan and Sangeeta Banerjee and, and many, many others, David Faring, um, working through those kind of things together, grant funding or your, your dissertation proposal or your plans for field work, your budget for this or that. Uh, really nice to be able to work with folks like that. Um, since then, yeah, peers are immensely valuable. Um, always were at Dartmouth. Uh, there was folks who were kind of a step or a couple mm -hmm. steps or many steps ahead of me. 
Um, at Princeton, it was quite different. There, I had I had peers from so many different fields. I was in Latin American Studies, uh, which is a a program that brings in folks um, for short to long visits, and these are like globally recognized people in a variety of fields. So, I had conversations with people who study film in Venezuela, or um, who are teaching courses on literature, or who did music, or poetry, or many, many other things, and social scientists, and, and some, some other folks, um, cool work on, on sonic landscapes in urban Brazil, and this, this sort of stuff. And so the, the landscape of, of ideas that I was exposed to there, like even within my own program, to say nothing of the rest of Princeton, uh, was also incredible. Now, I've had more as an assistant professor in Hong Kong, I've had sure. more chances to work with peers directly on research projects. When you have a little bit more stability, I think that's a little bit easier to do, to develop stuff. So this wet market project, for instance, um, and the things that I think will continue to spiral out of that, um, all that work is being done with my colleague, Ben Iaquinto, and with two of our students who are now off to grad school uh, this fall. That's Kylie Poon uh, and Kathy Tiang. She's at UCLA, Kylie is? Yep, Kylie's starting a PhD at UCLA, and Kathy will be starting a master's at McGill. My my academic grandchild. Huh? <laughs> that's right, that's right, the branches. <laughs> there we go, yeah. wonderful. Uh -huh. That's 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 wonderful to hear. Yeah. Um, talk about them, talk about your students. Oh, it's fantastic. Uh, I, I've always loved this part of the job, teaching. Mm -hmm. Teaching courses is great. It's wonderful. You get to work with great students in every institution I've been at. Um, it's been this way. So, and I've taught so at Princeton and Dartmouth, but also at Queens College. I taught when I was a graduate student. I taught mm -hmm. there for four years as an adjunct in the history program. Um, and I've also taught. Let's see. I guess at HKU and then those places, and then as a TA at Syracuse and Rutgers. Mm -hmm. At every one of these stops, I've had great students in lecture classes and in seminars, and that's wonderful. But as an assistant professor, I've had a chance now to actually actively mentor both undergraduate and graduate students, uh, to work with them on research projects on a longer timeline. Uh, and that's been really, really fantastic. I've, I've supervised now, uh, we'll call it somewhere between five and 10 interns as well, mm -hmm. research interns. Uh, some of them through the MAP Library Internship, uh, something I think it was created by Becky Liu, Professor Becky Liu at Hong Kong U, mm -hmm. um, but has become part of the, what we now call the Cartographica Laboratory and Library. So through that program, I've supervised a couple of interns doing really cool projects. Uh, one of them designing in part the, the website that we're gonna use to make this some of this material publicly accessible, uh, but other kinds of stuff as well. Um, and some of those students have gone on to do great things professionally. Uh, others are entering graduate school now or, or doing other stuff. And I'm super proud of all of them. And it's an enormous privilege to get to work with great students, especially when it's for more than just a class. It's sure it's great to work with them for a, the period of a class and help them write a cool term paper or do this sort of thing. But to see a student out in the field, like learning how to do geographical methods for themselves. Well, and, and you see how they develop as yeah. well. And you know what kinds of responsibilities they can take on as time goes on. Right. It's really a beautiful thing. It's wonderful. And and you know yourself that every student's a little bit different. They need like a little bit different kind of advice. Some really want to hit the ground running right away. Others need like a little bit more leading along. And, and some, some are more willing to accept their own mistakes sure. better than others. Sure, sure. You know, it's... Um, it's important to be discerning mm -hmm. when when mentoring students, for sure. Yeah. But but it's one of the uh, greatest rewards I think we have as academic geographers to provide that mentoring so that students are able to um, really practice the craft of geography in a sound manner. Yeah. You know? And I think I would say about about mentorship, I've probably had a a more solid appreciation of that than maybe some others uh, at my career stage, only because the chances that I've had, I think are, are, I owe so much to my mentors, yourself included, and first and foremost, I think. But if I hadn't had such great mentors, first you and then, and then others along the way, these opportunities I think would not have materialized for me. I wasn't, wasn't quite the person who was in the position to go out and grab stuff without a lot of advice and a lot of help. And so, I've appreciated this kind of mentorship my whole junior career. Uh, this gives me a different sense, I think, of, of uh, I'm appreciative now of being able to mentor. Well, I think also, if I, if I recall 100 years ago when you were around, uh, <laughs> I think that um, it, 
it was in some ways the questions that you posed mm. that encourage one to engage in mentoring. And you mm. might find that as well with the students that that you mentor. And I think that even though there is some shyness often, especially with undergraduates, it's important for students to be willing to take the risk of engaging in dialogue or being willing to engage in dialogue. And it can bear wonderful fruit in terms of uh, fine mentoring that will enhance one's, not just career, it's not just a job, it's really, it's really a wonderful way of life, yeah. you know, pursuing geography. Oh, I totally agree. I totally agree. Well, well Ben, um, I have to ask you with just a minute to go here, um, maybe two minutes. I might give you two we'll minutes. Stretch. We'll stretch. You know, we'll see. Do you have any, um, any words of advice for students that are interested in pursuing geography undergraduates or graduate students? And even, do, do you have any uh, insight you'd like to lend to colleagues in the field? Oh, I'll start with students. Okay, go ahead. Um, I think the thing I would tell students who are interested in, in pursuing either like knowledge in this field or a career in this field, uh, the, the biggest thing I would say is that your professors are often way more excited to talk to you than you think they will be. So students, at least, uh, in my experience, are often more nervous than they need to be about, about mm -hmm. approaching us, right? About their ideas or about uh, trouble that they're having in a class and need some help with or advice about the future. Um, we love talking about that stuff, at least many of us, uh, the, the cool folks among us. <laughs> anyway, the let, let me interrupt you for a moment. Do you think we as professors don't do enough to encourage students to reach out to us? We, we kind of create a a gulf between students and ourselves to where we're not as friendly as maybe we ought to be? Yeah, I think so. I think, well, at least I'll say I think we could do more. Mm -hmm. um, and, we... and and emailing as a, as a uh, communication norm doesn't help. No, I, yeah, I don't think so. Um, I don't know what the, what the fix is, and I think each place probably is going to have a different relationship with this because different places attract and serve different kinds of students, um, different kinds of educational needs and communities. So where I am now, for instance, uh, there's a much more, generally speaking, a much more rigid line between mm -hmm. faculty and students. Um, ways that you can break that down, perhaps, uh, I've, I've tweaked a, a couple of my own practices about office hours, for instance. Students at my institution do not often come to office hours. So I've made a pitch in the beginning, um, if you want to bring a friend, even a friend who's not in this class or more than one to office hours, this seems to make a difference. Like students are more comfortable coming really? in, in a small group mm -hmm. uh, than they would be just on their own. Uh, that, that mitigates some of the, the nervousness of going mm -hmm. to approach a, a professor. Uh, little things like that I found can, can make a big difference. Uh, so I think we could do a lot uh, as, professor, as, a, as an academic community to make ourselves more approachable and welcoming to students. Um, because as we've talked about, like this is one of the best parts of what we do is getting mm -hmm. to do that. So I think that's what I would say to students is like, just, just okay. be bold, approach mm -hmm. folks with your questions. Um, and, and we're for the most part, really jazzed to talk to you. For what was your other, the other part? For colleagues, colleagues, colleagues in the field, any suggestions, any insight? Um, maybe the other side of that same coin, maybe just thinking about how, how to be more inviting to students um, in a non specifically teaching capacity, right? So outside of a specific class that you're teaching, um, I think all of us could do a better job of thinking about how to incorporate students more into the, our scholastic activities, inviting them to talks, inviting them to, to work with us on research projects, but also just giving them advice and having them around for stuff, I think is, is really valuable and makes for a much more lively- Maybe breaking uh, down barriers. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe so. Absolutely. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a pragmatic way. Right. You know? Right. You know, um, well, you've certainly done well for yourself. You've presented papers at many uh, American Association of Geographers annual meetings. You've been very involved with the association. Um, your book has a, is it a 22 or 23 copyright? 23. A 23 copyright. What's the title of your book? Monstrous Politics, Geography Rights, and the Urban Revolution in Mexico City. 
by Vandy Press. Exactly. Vanderbilt Press. Amazing. So, you know, it it might not make the New York Times bestseller <laughs> list, but, you know, hey, for all you viewers, go out and buy a copy, okay? <laughs> Thanks for that. Ben, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. This has been great. Thanks for having me. It's a huge honor for me. Okay. And this concludes this episode of Conversation with a Geographer. Thank you.